One quick is to say uh, TJ is a professor in agriculture and I work as a program coordinator in the diversity office. So we have a nine month old. We got connected with the Lindsay's up on the Peaky Promise Dream Team. Um, and so I've been connected about three years there. And then TJ was like, man, that's my cool people see from some tea from uh, Mississippi at April. Well, I really was like, what's this Peaky Promise thing you going to every year you leave me for a week? <laughs> <laughs> This would have been the first time that she's gone without taking the baby with her, and I was like, no, nah, you can't leave me by myself. I'm so they can't wait time. this time. And it's funny because Canadians is from Newton, Mississippi, is that right? And so his family lives not too far. We found out some of the blood is going in somewhere. We may be related. So. Everybody, Just about everybody from Mississippi related. Be careful. You know, you're either called by God from Mississippi or you're born in Mississippi. That's the only way you end up in Mississippi. It's okay. <laughs> so true. <laughs> So we're going to go ahead and get started about effective communication. This is going to be real fun, y'all. Yeah, real it's going to be real fun because we've traveled a long way in a short amount of time as far as communicating. So, uh, yeah. so it's going to be light. I mean, hopefully it's going to be a lot of that, but we're just going to be extremely vulnerable. Um, but we can So um, communication, one thing that we realized um, very quickly when we first got married is that we communicate two different ways. When I say two different ways, I'm talking about opposite ends of the spectrum yes. kind of uh, communication. Because here's the thing, I like to, I'm a talker, so I like to explain, I like for everything to be, you know, just understood, so I'm kind of long-winded, not going to lie. And this guy, I love him, but he's a, he said it yesterday, he's a scientist, so he thinks in the heavens. Like, seriously, I'm like, <laughs> bring it down, like, let's be practical here. And he's like, well, I just think that, and I'm like, what are you saying? I don't even understand what you're saying. And in the beginning, it was so frustrating because I'm like, what I'm saying is so clear. You're, and it isn't you because he's been prophesied over as a genius. And I think that he just didn't realize he is a human too. So bring it down. Like, come on. But it was, it was, I mean, it was, it was bad. Well, it, it, for, for me, it was hard because as a scientist, you usually work by yourself. And so when I'm doing any type of publication, I'm doing any type of research, I know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's not my job for you to understand what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. It's been in my head for months and months, and I've been working on this research project. And so when I put it on paper, it's perfect. So anytime, well, that's what I thought when I first got married. So is that you know whatever that comes from here out of here or on paper is perfect because I've thought about it because I'm I'm an abstract conceptualization kind of person, and she's very picture oriented, like show me, show me, show me. I'm thinking, I don't have to show you. I just use my words to paint a beautiful picture. You just not paying attention. <laughs> That's literally what I thought. Now, I don't know if anybody, if you've ever been there before, but that is literally what I thought. I'm like, this is so perfect. Like, even now, when we communicate, I get so upset when my words are taken out of context or she'll repeat to me what I said, and I'm like, That's not what I said. I spent 15 minutes thinking about what I said before I told you, and you have the audacity to get it wrong. <laughs> It was rough, y'all. It was rough and sweet. So it was, it was a power struggle as far as communication it was. when you first started. So, so we're just kind of going to go through a couple things. We just kind of thought and prayed about, okay, where, and not that we're masters at it, but I think we figured some things out. If we can help in areas that we feel like we have a better understanding, the Bible means definitely um, be blessed with this. So I'd start off with this, and this is so interesting because it's true. Just because you're talking doesn't mean you're communicating. And I think people think we're, we're going to talk it out, we're going to talk it out, we're not going to let this fester, and we're going to figure this thing out. But talking and communicating are two different things. And I think because I'm a talker, I'm thinking, yeah, we're talking this out, this is great. But we were spinning our wheels. We were talking, 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 but it was, we weren't going anywhere. And so I think that effective communication, there's a couple other things you have to put into play as it pertains to just talking. Anybody can talk and run your mouth. But are you effectively communicating or are you getting anywhere? Right, and so even when we were, we find ourselves spinning our wheels, and this is a, was a key for me, as we were talking and communicating, I'd go back and say, well, what, what did I actually hear her say? What, was I just talking just to have a rebuttal to be talking? Which most times it was because I'm never wrong. Y'all you know, pray for my wife because I'm never wrong. <laughs> Y'all know you need some real prayer for that. Keep me at the top of your prayer list. Yeah, but, you know, <laughs> but oftentimes in our marriage, when we were talking, we were just going around what we call the crazy cycle. 
and we just kept talking around each other, talking around each other. And we were talking maybe to state what is obvious, but we weren't really communicating, so to speak. And even something like body language, like she'll come in and if I'm playing a game, because that's the way I de stress. Always playing the game. Well, think, think, about, think about this. Oh, I heard an eight minutes, but I always play the game. She would often try to take my focus from NBA 2K. Because look, I wanted to be in the NBA. I knew that one, once, I, once I stopped growing at six feet, I realized that it's probably not going much further than that. So you just create yourself on a game, and you sign yourself to the highest salary, and like, baby, we're going to make it. <laughs> on NBA 2K. Right. But that is that's one of my de stressors. It's one of my de-stresses. Same thing with Call of Duty. I mean, you can shoot somebody, no repercussions. You start out in the game. You can't do that in real life. I don't like that. I call it the murder, murder, kill, kill game, and it's just not good. My daughter's saying murder. So, so she'll come in and she's like, babe, you want to talk? And I can listen and play the game at the same time. <laughs> no, you cannot. Thank you. You cannot but, effectively listen. But I, I realized, that I, I, know, I noticed that how I can repeat what she says, exactly what she says, and I'm playing the game, and I'm like, yes, I got it, word for word. And she was like, you are listening to words. And I was like, no, nah, I really wasn't. But body language for me, for her, is an indication if I am, if we're actually communicating. Because I don't even have to say a word. She come in, she start talking. If I would just pause the game, and lay the controller down. She's like, I have this attention. I could not even be paying attention. But that is. Tell me that. It was an example. I don't get that. It was an example. Stop for you. Stop for you. But that's how we we start that process of communicating because like it's not just talking, just the body language of being intent. Of, uh, like I'm listening, so to speak, and I think that goes uh, goes a long way for us. When she's like, "Okay, now I can really talk to you." Kind of and I think number two is so interesting. What we have here, sarcasm is dangerous. I'm I'm naturally sarcastic. It's just how I was wired. It's in my DNA. He was not that way, but now that we've been married, he's not sarcastic. And it's like, this is not good. But it's real because, I mean, I am. I'm just, I'm just sarcastic to the point to where when I work with my students, I say, good morning, you guys. Like, I love you guys, but I'm sarcastic. So if you're offended easily, please let me know because I won't know. And then they were like, oh, Miss Joy, she came for me. I was just being me, you know? So, and even in marriage, we had to be so careful because I'd say things and I'd be like, ah, and he's like, that's, that's not funny. Like, I was just, I was just being me. And she's naturally sarcastic and I'm naturally petty. So these <laughs> it's not, it is not so, uh, those two combinations, it's just it's explosive. Even when you're joking around, because she'll say something sarcastic, and I'm like, okay, I got you. Because the P in PhD for me, it stands for pick. So I study pick, and she'll throw some shade in there, and I'm like, you're not gonna beat me. I throw some penny on top of it, and she throw some more shade, then I sprinkle it with a little penny garnish, <laughs> and then before, before you know, we really mad, even though we were just joking. Right. But that, that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more about that, especially when we're in heated times of, of fellowship. Now we don't we don't call them arguments; we call them intense times of fellowship. Time. We don't argue; we just have intense times of fellowship, right? I don't, I don't argue. Anybody. It takes two people to argue, and so I just I state my case eloquently, and she wants to be arguing. We'll see. Argue. We'll see. Stand by. But no, no. The sarcasm is it's, you it's know, dangerous. Right, it really right. is. If you really. I'm oh, sorry. Really. Oh, even if you even if you do have the intent to really effectively communicate. The sarcasm and the petty has to just go to sleep for a second to really get through to something because we can joke, but after a while you start picking, and then it's like, wait a minute, like he just said something that that struck a nerve, and then I'm not kidding anymore, like I'm, I'm fighting for keeps, if that makes sense. And so, if we're effectively communicating all those things, personality, DNA has to be put aside. You have to be really intentional about the words that you use. So, put the sarcasm and pettiness aside. Yeah, because oftentimes, like we'll we'll. Our close, close friends, like we'll joke about each other's parents. Like we'll throw, because I'm the king at your mama jokes, because I grew up, because I was real short growing up, and so I used to get picked on. So, how did I fight with my words? And so, I go to school, and that's how I fought, because I couldn't beat up the bully. And so, what I did was when I finally escaped, I talked about it. And he couldn't catch me because I was fast. And so, even <laughs> we'll joke around about, you know, your mama's this, this, and this, being sorry. Yeah, just playing around, but. Sometimes those things can like, oh, why you say that about my mama? I don't get confidence. Like, 
told me confident it was still funny. So uh, <laughs> even, even in times like that, you have to be careful with the sarcasm. Right? That's who you are. You know, that's totally fine. But you always just have to be careful where that sarcasm lands because where you intend for it to land, sometimes it just may not land there. You weren't being uh, malicious or anything. It just happens that way sometimes. So be careful there. And then two. So when you listen, I was in the beginning of marriage. I was really bad about this because I just was. Just being honest. When you listen, it's important to listen with the intent to understand and not the intent to respond. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening, but I'm getting my own rebuttal. I'm getting it together like, I heard them for you to say this. So really what he's saying, I'm listening, but not really because I got something to say. So I took my tongue, when he get done, I don't want to interrupt him. But, and you said such and such, he's like, whoa, but I just said this, did you hear me? I mean, I heard you, but I had this response ready, so that's what I was getting together. And the crazy part was about it was, I could never explain things like so concisely, because like I said, I'm a scientist. It has to be elaborate, it has to be mind-blowing, it has to, it's a little dramatic. And so I would say something, my apology would be in there somewhere, and I would- deep through find it. Yes, but she wouldn't focus on that. She was focused on the response and rebuttal. And so even though I layered it, she was like, oh, but what about this? I'm like, I just apologize for that. You didn't even hear me. And so then we go back in the crazy cycle. And I have to repeat what I said. She's like, oh my God, another 10 minutes of little quick. And I'm like, hold on, child, just wait. It's in there. You just have to, you just have to get it out. Um, but it's, it's so important because with her, uh, I'm a fixer. And I think most guys, most males, we try to fix the problem because I'm like, if I can't fix it, why are you telling me? I'm not, I'm not good at just listening for no reason in my mind. And so she would come in, I, I saw a video one time that sums up so perfectly, you might have seen the video, it was a clip. Um, the uh, wife comes in and she's sitting there talking to her husband and she was like, I just, I get so hung up on stuff and then sometimes it just makes my head hurt. You know, it just, I cannot, you know, sweaters and stuff, blah, 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 I can't put a sweater on. And then the guy panned out and he was like, mm -hmm. yeah. The screen panned out and the lady had a nail stuck in her head. <laughs> And he was like, well, baby, all you have to do is, she's like, no, 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 just listen to me, just listen to me. And that's how I feel sometimes. I feel like there's a problem that I can easily solve when she's talking to me. And she just wanted me to do it. That's not what she's here for. But I found that she just really just wants me to listen. If she wants the nails still stuck in her head, we can deal with it later. We can, there's emergency rooms all over that we can, that we can go to. But just, just being so... Um, I just been, seek to understand and not to be understood. And so I feel like that really helped us um, in marriage, just communicating to where we don't just keep hopping back and forth in that crazy cycle of you know, pointless communication. And I think one thing he did, the way he's beginning to do probably the last two years or so, is when I'll say something, say I'll come home from work and I have an issue or say something he's done, I'll say something he'll say, do you want, were you just telling me to listen or do you want to hear my thoughts? And I appreciate that because sometimes I don't want to hear your thoughts, I just want you to listen to me. And I value the fact that you value the importance of understanding, like, you know, right now, I just need to vent, babe. Don't try to fix it right now. We can fix it because it's going to need to be fixed. But right now, fixing it for me is just being like, I hear you, babe. Well, let me know what I can do for you. Or he said, no, I, I want to know what you think. And then that, from there, we would start communicating back and forth. But sometimes it's not the best time to talk, and he understands that. But we didn't learn that at first because at first, every time I said something, but, but, babe, wait, just listen to me. I am listening. I heard you, and now this is my response. But I didn't need a response at the moment. So understanding when it's time to talk and when it's time to listen is important too. And it's, and it's, it's the equivalent, because like I said, I grew up on a farm, so if something's, there's an issue, I need to fix it, because your livelihood is on fixing that piece of equipment. And so she'll come in and say something, I say, all right, am I a toolbox or am I a garbage can? Do we need to fix this, or is it just the, you're just gonna dump it in, dump it in? Because I'm okay with you dumping it in, that's fine, but if I need to be a toolbox, let me know so I can be prepped up and I, I think for, for her, like I said, it goes a long way for her to just be like, okay, I can speak, I can vent, and he's not going to try to fix it or fix me all the time. So that goes a long way. And also, um, the next point is I practice hearing what she's saying. So she'll come in and say something like I'm doing this and this or I have this issue, blah, blah. I would ask questions. So what I hear you saying is, and I repeat it, and you would be amazed how many times I get it wrong. <laughs> because she'll, she'll say this and this, and I'm, I'm really listening, and I say, okay, baby, what I hear you saying is this. And she's like, no, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, so what I hear you saying is, and I repeat exactly what she said, no, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> that's, that's typically how it goes. But what it does, it, it helps me kind of put 
put the uh, put the box on where I need to focus my listening or whether I need where I need to focus the conversation. And so because if you're hearing correctly, then you can respond correctly. And that's really that's something that we started probably two years ago too. We didn't figure it out until after been a couple of years in, and we actually got it from a couple of pastors. We were actually having conversations with them about some things that we thought were good or some things that we thought that we could um, just kind of help do. And so they said, "Well, repeat back to me what I hear you saying is this," and they repeated it back. And I know he just said it too, but it's it's so funny how you'll think that you heard what a person said, but Oftentimes, even what you communicate about it out of your mouth might not be your heart. So if you're not careful, you can say things, and it's just like, but what's really going on here? And if you don't take the time to say, well, what I hear you saying is this, and I say, well, that's not what I said. Well, that's what I heard you say. And then I'm like, okay, well, am I communicating what I really feel then? Am I really communicating how I'm really feeling? Because if I am, then him understanding what I'm saying should be a little different than what we're doing right here. But not taking the time to stop and repeat back, then there's assumptions come in. Like, well, I'm assuming he feels this way, or I'm assuming she feels this way. And assumptions can be just as dangerous as not taking the time to really sit back and repeat back what you heard the person say. Because even, like she said, I, I operate in the heavenlies, and I take that as a compliment. <laughs> but <laughs> I guess. <laughs> close to Jesus all the time. But what right. even when she would stop and say, okay, babe, what I hear you saying is, it helped me realize that she has no idea what I'm talking about. Not in a bad way, but it's thinking like, well, if I'm verbalizing this when I'm really trying, what about when I'm not trying? What about when I'm frustrated and I'm venting and we, we're having issues with each other? Or there's something going on in our marriage that we really need to talk about. I'm not verbalizing it correctly. And that's I've seen it be super frustrating for her. She just break down crying. I'm like, what you crying for? This ain't even an issue. And she's like, I just don't know what you're saying. And I'm thinking that I can see how that's frustrating. Mm -hmm. I can see how that's extremely frustrating. So it's really important to, to do that. And I say, and I just kind of dipped over into the assuming thing, the, the mind reading assuming thing. I can be guilty. He said he's a fixer, but I think even naturally I like to make things, are you okay? Is everybody good? Naturally, I'm just a person. Just want to make sure everybody's good. And so when I try to help him, like, babe, well, this is what? And he's like, and it was funny because before we left the hotel this morning, he had said, he had started a sentence and I tried to finish it. He was like, so you going to read my mind? And I'm like, I'm just trying to help. And so he was like, let's not mind read. I'm like, are you serious right now? But I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of just trying to help and be like, oh, babe, you meant this. I definitely didn't mean that. Definitely was not going that way. And I'm like, okay. Now, there are sometimes we joke around and we finish each other's sentences, you know, all the cute kind of stuff. But when we're really trying to effectively communicate, it's not a good the, idea. the assumption part, the mind reading part, you, you dip into dangerous territory because what, what happens for me, when I mind read with her, it cuts her off. And she's like, why do you just keep cutting me off? I'm thinking, I'm trying to be together with you. Like, we're trying to go forward, not cut you off. But it seems as her is cutting her off because I stop her train of thought. And because I operate in the heavenly, so to speak, she's like, well, well, what do I bring to the table? I can communicate, and I don't want to diminish her or suppress on how she's feeling by jumping in and trying to feel for her, so to speak. And even, too, that made me think, I think when we, when we do communicate, we do a pretty good job of this now, hadn't always. Let me finish. Don't, don't interject. Like, let me finish my thought. Let me finish what I'm saying. And I think sometimes to try to help, people will say, well, well, yeah, you're saying such and such. Maybe I am saying that. And even if and it's the patience of saying, like, I know where you're going, so I could just finish this conversation right now by just telling you where you're going, but it doesn't help. It, that, that doesn't work. Let me finish my thought process. Even if you repeat back the exact same thing and you know what I'm about to say and you know every single word, listen, let me finish, and then we go from there. Because if you stop... And it's like a baby, I got it, I got you, I got you. No, 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 you ain't got me. Wait, hear me out, and then we'll go from there. And so I think, too, even the cutting off thing can be so dangerous. Yeah, so those are just uh, the happy time communication aspects that we wanted to share. So now we're going to dip into, say, if you have an intense time of fellowship, if you are, you know. If Argument. You, if you know you're right. Popping off. And she knows she right. Here's the fun part. What what happens then? So we're gonna we're gonna dive into just a few um, few scenarios, few things that we that helped us through it, um, and hopefully, like I said, hopefully it minister you or you can take these, you can leave them. But I, this is the fun part, <laughs> the really fun part. So avoid trying to communicate when you're angry. It just doesn't get far. It just doesn't get far. If you're really angry, sometimes all you see is red. And even if you think that you're trying to fix what may be going on, 
it just doesn't go far. And then oftentimes you're even out of character in some capacities. When you're mad, like, you're just a whole different person, like, for real, for real. And so you're not really who you are. You're probably not who they married. You know what I'm saying? So it's important to take the time to just <sighs> chill for a second. Now, sitting on it for four or five days is not healthy, I don't think. But taking some time to kind of chill out for a second, take a walk, take a deep breath, simmer down and then hit at it again when you're not upset. They say don't spank your kids when you're angry, that kind of thing. It's just when you're angry, it's just not a healthy state of mind, and you're probably just not going to get much accomplished. I wish my daddy knew not to spank your kids when you're angry. <laughs> because on the, on You the, turned out fine. Yeah, but there's still some screws loose, because I remember, because my, on the farm, there was never just a belt around. And so sometimes I'll be praying, God, I know he's going to be mad. I know he's going to get a whooping. Please let him just grab a belt. Because sometimes it was extension cords and fly swatters. It just whatever you can get his hand. But that on. was bad, y'all. It was three of them. They were bad. They needed the the. You guys we were, needed it. We y'all were, were bad. We were country. We didn't. Y'all were bad. We didn't have any toys to play with, so we had to make our own stuff. Like they our, fought raccoons and dogs. They were bad. Joy, y'all were bad. You notice on Facebook Live, Peter gonna send me <laughs> a. Peter, they no, they were y'all were bad, babe. Y'all you need five, You can get five to ten for that now. <laughs> <laughs> Lord have mercy. Were y'all bad, babe? No, we were innovative. <laughs> so we didn't we didn't have kites growing up. So what we did, we grabbed beetles and we put thread around their legs and we threw them in the air and we just held the thread. I kid you not. That's what we did. That's those. Or were you our put kites. you put, you set the Shh. you set the glue traps on fire with the with the mice on them and killed them. They shouldn't been running through there like they were paying rent. <laughs> they don't they were bad, nothing. y'all. So hence, that's why they need to be spanked. They were bad. Anywho, so um, just just being angry because you know, like I said, I get. I remember one time I got angry. I got so mad, and she, my older oh my brother, they would be like, "Oh man, TJ got anger issues." Blah blah. And I was like, "I don't have any anger issues. I just, you know, we, I'm just expressing my anger in a healthy manner." But one time we got mad, and you just want to tell the story right now. You can tell it. So when we first got this married, this is probably the last time we had a big blowout. Yeah, right? this is the last time we had yeah. a big blowout. So um, like a when the I last was, year, was it last year. Two years ago. Yeah, anyway, last year. last year, last year sometime. So I'm I'm on a uh, assistantship salary. So you know Mississippi State is paying part all of my tuition, but they pay me in gum. And so we didn't have <laughs> much we didn't have much money to go around. So I'm talking about in, to clean the the couch. We just got the vacuum cleaner. We put it on the couch and vacuum the cla- couch. It was so a rough time. It was, it was, it Maybe was, that was two years ago. It was two years ago. So it was it was tight time. So money was tight. And so she was like. But hey, I want to get my hair done. So anytime she wanna get the hair done and you know she wants to go buy the hair, it's never like a next week kind of thing. It's more of like, okay, we gotta Baby, save you didn't up have for to say that part. What? <laughs> Just say she wanna get her hair done. Let's leave we, it right there. Thank you. We're communicating, right? We're communicating. I wanna be transparent. So you take we, it we get to far. the point and we save up four months. This that's how long we had to save up. We had to save up <laughs> four months. You're being dramatic today. No, I'm serious. It's it's a, it was a big deal because we have to now listen, when you when you don't have money, everything is a big deal. Everything. Having a mon- having money is not the problem, not having it is. So when you don't have it, everything's a big deal. So we save up four months, we're gonna we're gonna get we got the hair, but this 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 is the thing that made me upset. It was the wrong kind. And so instead of just, we can't take it back because they took the money out, out of the account. So after you order, they took the money out of the account. And they was like, oh, it's going to be 45 business days before we get it back. You, it didn't take you 45 business days to take it out. So I need it back now because, like, we have to eat. So, it was not like that, babe. So, so anywho. He's so, so dramatic. Oh my so God. she's on her phone. She's ordering the stuff. She's ordering it. The picture. I have to paint the picture. So she's ordering this stuff and comes out of the account. I'm like, dang, just I hate seeing that amount of money come out of the account at one time. And I'm playing the game. I was playing Madden. I never forget. I was sitting there playing Madden, and I'm I'm doing great. I'm a quarterback. I'm throwing for like 300 yards. <laughs> you know, I'm giving the other team the business. I'm picking apart the cover too. So what happens is she we we does this. So I'm I already feel a certain type of way. So I'm well, already we agree though. We agree. We did agree. We, we did agree. agree. we did agree. We did agree. And um, the vending machines in my building has a little card swipe thing, which is the most dangerous thing for me because I'm a snacker, and so I can spend. Ten dollars at a time. Fifteen dollars a day on snacks at the vending machine. I was fasting. I was hungry. <laughs> so if you were fasting, why was you in the vending machine? That was at the end of the day. So, so what happened was there were there was a there was a whole there were a whole bunch of charges. She was like, "Dude, did you go crazy at the vending machine?" And it was eight dollars, eight dollars, and that's where it started. <laughs> so I paused the game. 
I put it down on this. We didn't have a coffee table, so I made this little table out of pallet wood. And so I put it down on a pallet wood table, and I had to like put the controller a certain way because it would fall through the, the slots. So I turn the controller sideways, and I say, excuse me? You spent $8 at the vending machine? And I'm looking around like, Holy Spirit, you got to help me because I don't, cause I don't feel you right now. I said, yes, baby, I spent $8 at the vending machine. Why well, did you spend $8? Baby, you just spent over $200 in preparation <laughs> to get your hair done. So now, so the process. But we agreed. We did agree. Okay. But the process is not finished. And now we got to spend more money to actually get your hair done. And so I'm thinking, we're talking about $8 here. But Eight. I'm thinking, we agreed to this charge, this $8 thing. We've talked about the whole vending machine going crazy thing, okay? We are on a budget. We're mindful of what we spent, and $8 was not it. And I'm thinking, the whole time, and, and she's right. She was, she was right the whole time because we had a, <laughs> I have a vending machine budget. Because <laughs> he, he spent $30 in one. I'm telling you, he's would, out of control, I've but God is blessing his heart. At this point, I've exceeded my vending machine budget, but that's not, that's not what we're talking about right now. We're talking about 32 quarters is what we're talking about. And you're trying we just, to make it sound so small. You said you said have to live with. <laughs> but, 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 that, but what happened, the, the whole essence of that, and then, of course, I got mad. I blew up. I walked in. I was like, I can't believe we're talking about this. And on my way to the kitchen, I anointed the door. I said, bless you. I just anointed the door. No, that's he did not did. anoint the door. He hit the door. I anointed the door forcefully. <laughs> so it wouldn't break, and I just said. But babe, that's not what happened. I went. I, he was so yeah. heated. I was like, okay, this is not good. And see, mind you, he mentioned briefly that his brother was like, oh, TJ has anger issues, and he had been saying that the whole time we were engaged, the whole time, and I had never seen him. I had never seen him, so I was like, his brother is a hater. I love you, Terrell. <laughs> Anyways, I was like, he just hates. He just hates. He know whatever, whatever. He was like, I'm telling you, Joy, he got anger issues. Beware. <laughs> He's punched holes in walls, and he's done. And I'm like, who is this guy that he's talking about? I've never seen him. So I'm like praying, like, God. I said, TJ, I said, you know, is he right? He was like, babe. He was like, I've been delivered and covered by the blood. And I said, okay. <laughs> okay. So, and legit, up until this point, I had never seen this anger stuff. So I believed him until this day. And so he had gotten so upset about it that I was like, okay, I don't feel safe. Like, I legit, and maybe I'm a little dramatic now that I look back, but hey, I didn't feel safe at the moment. And so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go upstairs, and I'm just going to let you have your time. And so I go upstairs, and I go to the guest bedroom, and I lock the door. And I was a little, like, worried because I had never seen him so, like, upset. And I was like, this is just not good. This was before our baby or anything. So I was just sitting in there, and I think I was a little crying or something like that. And so he comes in up to the door, and he's like, open the door. And I'm like, babe, I'm not, because you're just not, you're a little out of control. And he hits the door, like, super hard. You did. You didn't annoy the door to the kitchen. You annoyed the door I was in. Like, he was trying to get in there. And I'm like, if he's that angry, I'm on the other side of this door. What is he going to do? So I was freaking out a little bit. And I was like, TJ, leave, just leave me alone. Like, I don't like this. This is not good. And so he was like, so you're not going to open the door? And I'm like, no. Like, I was not okay with how you were that's what happened babe no yeah yeah so that, that's forgot. true that's true we come on eight quarters he was we lit were, about them eight quarters yeah, we were gonna we were gonna get there eventually i was gonna tell you the whole story <laughs> but but what happened was is within that anger and we we went around the the building five times but the, the anger part of it was it, it turns you into something that you don't think you are and to keep feeding that anger while you're arguing, it, you just you just don't get anywhere. You, we've all know that we've been angry, we've had arguments when we were angry, and then we come back, we're like, dang, we really didn't accomplish nothing. Like, have you ever looked back at a situation like, man, I'm so glad I got angry at that? Probably no, not. no, because it, it just it doesn't produce the righteousness for God, and so at at that time, it's like I don't want to be so angry where we get nothing done, where, where nothing actually happens. And then my grandmother, uh, <laughs> it was so funny. My grand, you have to know my grandmother. She is uh, she says whatever she wants to. She did that before she got older. So now that she's older, she really, she told, y'all, she told my daddy he was ugly one time in front of my daddy. <laughs> and so that's a whole other story. But I was, I was telling her, I was like, well, oh, is yeah, he? We're, we're, we're. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I love my father-in-law. So, He's amazing. So, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I almost went back. I almost went back. 
but her daddy on Facebook, so I, I decided to chill out. So yeah, his daddy isn't on Facebook. But um, I was telling my grandmother, you know, about all these tips and stuff that we got their marriage counseling. And I was like, Grandma, guess what? We call her Grandma Mother. I said, Mother, guess what? She said, What? I said, We heard this tip. Never go to bed angry. And she was like, Okay. And I was like, What do you think about that? She was like, What if it take a while to figure out? I said, I never thought about that. And she's like, Sometimes it's okay to go to bed angry if you talk to each other and be like, Hey, I need a moment. Let's talk about this at another time. Because she said, at that point, it diffuses the situation. Y'all can get a good night's sleep. And she said, even though you probably won't, you you are you leave at a peaceful point to pick up for the next time. Because she said, if you sit there and try to hash that all night, you're going to be delirious. You're going to be you know, uh, sleep drunk. And then you try to figure something out. While you're still angry, you just, you just become exhausted and you just quit. And you just put it to the side and it's like, OK, whatever. But it comes back up again later in a different form. And so I was like, man, I was like, that's really, really good. But you, in a sense like that, you have to do what works for you. You, you have to get with your spouse. And you have to say, OK, you know, I need a minute. Because Joy, she's, she's like, you know, I like to figure stuff out right then because I got to go back to playing the game. And <laughs> she is like, she's like, you know what, I need a minute. But then I can't focus on the game because I'm thinking oh, I, her brain is going everywhere. But that's what works for us. And so situations like that, if you don't want to go to bed mad, that's totally fine. But for us, we decided to say, hey, you know, I'm still upset. I'm still really upset. But hey, let's let's sleep on it. Let's talk about it. And let's sleep on it. We'll talk about it in the morning. Or we'll before we before we leave to go to work, we're just gonna we, we go to bed. We went to bed angry one time. We left the next day. We didn't even say bye. We we're just like, do what you want to do. I don't care. You still mad? Cause I'm still mad. But what happens when you put that when you put that down for a while? Both of you come to an agreement and say, okay, yeah, we are still mad. This is not situated. It's not resolved yet. But I'm still gonna love you through it, and we're still gonna be able to leave those doors open for, for communication a little later. So then when you argue also, especially when you're having an argument, have an end in mind. Where are we going? What are we trying to accomplish here? What's going to come of this? We're arguing, but if we're arguing in circles with no point, we're just hollering back and forth. Which leads me to the next idea of your tone of voice. TJ, <laughs> it's so funny because we'll have a conversation. I'm saying, bring it, I'll say, bring it down. Bring it down. I'm not yelling. Why is your voice elevated? The elevation pitch of your voice is too high. Bring it down. Then you're like, is this better? Yes, it is, because you are, your voice is elevated, and I need you to bring it down, because I know that you're worked up. Because when you get worked up, your voice, why do our voices go high when we worked up? I don't know, but they do. And so I say, babe, bring it down a little bit, and then it causes him to kind of chill even so. So when, you, when, when I ask him that, and he does a good job for the most part, but I, sometimes he gets annoyed, stop telling me to bring it down. We'll bring it down. I'll, I'll, I'll stop, you know. So, but that, that really, really helps, and we, we – in serious times, it's not as, as funny, but it's important. It's so important. You know, and, and for me, when, when things like this happen, when we have these intense times of fellowship, um, it's so easy to revert back to what's, um, what's comfortable. And f for me, in a situation like that, pettiness is comfortable because it, what it does, it deflects. It deflects from me. It deflects from the situation. And so uh, it was a couple weeks ago, we were talking about something, and, of course, I was playing a game. And then she, like, brought it up while I was playing. And another thing, be careful when you bring this kind of stuff up. We'll talk about that later, too. So we, she brought it up, and I was like, okay, I'm not playing the game. And I'm, I'm passionate about a lot of things. So I'm getting passionate. I'm getting excited. I'm talking about She was like, lower your voice. And I was like, baby, if I was yelling at you, you would know. I Trust me, you would know. You'd probably go back in the room and lock yourself up again. But you would know. You didn't know. say that. And if you would have, it would have been an issue. I was thinking it, but I didn't say it, so Amen. I'm working on it. Amen. But those those things what it <laughs> what it does for us is that helps me that helps me like she said it helps me rein it back in to bring it down because at the end of the day what I think about is I don't want my wife to think that I'm talking at her reckless because that does a lot more in damage wise than if if I'm completely wrong because I don't want my wife to think that I'm disrespecting her her or talking at her like she doesn't matter and when I when I become un passionate about certain topics, certain things, that shows her that, you know what, he can, he can talk to me like he has some sense. This is the man that I married. This is the caring person that I married. And so she, but that's what works for us. That's what works for us. But you have to talk about that kind of stuff. So that tone of voice is important. And even to the defense game, I can put up a defense like nobody's business. Like Dennis Robin. She played defense like Dennis Robin. <laughs> the not the not the not the ninety one not the ninety one for Chicago Bulls defense Dennis Robin. The number ten for the Detroit Pistons, Dennis Robin. I mean she's on it. Are you done? 
So, uh, but he's right though. I can be super. I can be super defensive. But when you when you come for me and I feel like you're you're targeting me or you're 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 playing against me or you're talking at me sometimes, I can feel defensive. But understanding that when those defenses go up, communication goes out of the window because really I'm just trying to make sure that I'm good. So whatever's coming my f my way, I'm deflecting. I'm pushing back. I'm what I'm not even. I'm receptive and I'm not receiving in any way. My mind's not open, my heart's not open, and I'm not really ready to communicate through anything. And so I think for me, oftentimes I have to remember, he said it yesterday, we're on the same team. He is not out to get me. I don't have to defend myself in this conversation. I don't have to be right. I don't have to win this argument, if you will. So understanding that we're trying to get to something here, I got to learn to communicate with this man because he's my husband. So I got to make sure that we're on the same page and we move forward. So he's not trying to come for me. Chill, Joy, just take a deep breath. He not. But I think oftentimes, even in life, in whether it's the workplace or whatever, sometimes you have to stay on the defense. If not, you will get got in East Street. So I, I have to remember that I have to take my defense hat off when I come home because he's on my team. He's not on the opposite team. And so I had to be mindful of being like, Joy, chill. He's not, he is not trying to do anything except for love you, figure out the situation. And if he's telling me something that maybe I don't want to hear or that burns or stings, he's still trying to help me. So I can say, okay, wow, that, that hurts. Not going to lie. That, that stings or Wow, is that what you saw? Is that what you is that what I'm portraying here? That doesn't feel good when a person is honest and vulnerable with me about maybe an area I need to grow in, but at the same time understanding it's only for my growth and for me being better because his goal is to see me be better. And and when you think about what happens when you play defense, she says it, you know, communication goes out the window. At that point you're going to uh self uh you you're going to self preserve because it's like whatever you throwing over here, I don't want. And so Think about defense in, in basketball. When you're playing defense, you don't want them to advance anything. You don't want them to get a shot up. You're trying to you don't steal the ball. You're going to block it. You can do whatever you can not to let them get further. And that's what happens in a marriage when you talk about communication. When you, when you start to put those defenses up, and for me, I start to deflect. I start to be petty. I start to throw shade and that kind of stuff. It, what it does is it, it, it stops her from coming this way because it's uncomfortable. And that is that stops the momentum from that conversation actually happening. And then you you don't you don't even get in the crazy cycle. You stay in one spot of the crazy cycle, and nothing ever gets better because nothing ever gets said. Nothing ever gets past that defensive wall. And then you just you, you sitting there looking at each other. And especially if somebody come over to the house, they know when y'all been arguing. And so you got to sit there and act like nothing has happened. And you just looking at y'all. It's like, oh uh, yeah, they've been arguing. I know because when they go when they, as soon as they get in the car, they were like, man, they were arguing right before we got over here. <laughs> Yes, yes, people do that, people do that. But um, th just be careful of those defenses because I'll, I know my defenses are impenetrable. I know they are because I'm on guard with the people that I work with, the people that I don't like, the people that I don't <laughs> care too much for. Now, I love everybody, but I don't trust everybody. And so it's so easy to bring that home to her and not even try. And so when she steps on my toes or we get into an argument or something that's really sensitive, they go up, not even knowing. And what happens is we shut we shut our spouse out, not even knowing, not even realizing it. And so, like I said, those those defenses are extremely dangerous. But you just have to identify what those walls are when they come up and how to uh, bring those walls down because we are on the same team. So this is something that I I think I had to to learn just because I'm a free talking free person, open book. Let's talk about it. I walk through this. Let me help. I'm a helper by nature. But when you're a free talker in certain situations, that's just not too good. So everything in your head doesn't need to be said. Everything that's going on up here is not meaningful, meaningful to come out here. And for me, because I like to get stuff off my chest, I'm, I definitely think I'm a confrontational person, not in a negative way. In other words, if I feel a vibe, hey, like we good, see? I mean, you just kind of act a little type of way, we good? You know, just make sure we good. I don't mind doing that. Some people will be like, oh, so he acting shady. All right, I got some for him, but that's not me. I don't mind just going up and being like, hey, I just felt a little vibe. It could be me. I could be, I could have got on the wrong side of the bed. I could be extra emotional today, but I just feel like something was weird between us. Are we good? And so even in those times and in those moments, if it comes into an argument or disagreement, I hope it wouldn't. Saying everything in your head is just not safe. It's not healthy, and it's, it doesn't always get places. And understanding that the, the timing of the communication is so important. 
that timing of is, is now the right time to bring up that issue that I've been holding on to for about two weeks? Because I could, if I lather up with this, it's going to be a home run. Probably not. And so understanding that everything that's in my head doesn't have to be said. And, I, and she alluded to this about bringing it up. And I joke about, you know, I'm like, babe, why do you want to bring up these issues when I'm playing a game? Like, really, I'm like, I'm in the middle of giving Kevin Durant this work. And you, <laughs> you, you really... You really want to bring this up right now because then I got to pause the game and then I got to get back into the mode. Then I don't want to play no mode. Then I got to save. Anyway, so some, you, when you bring these things up, you, you don't want to suppress your feelings forever. But, for example, I, I told you about, you know, um, uh, our, our, I was very brief about, you know, the expectations that I had of sex coming in. So when we're in the bed and I'm thinking, like, yep, yep, it's going to go down. And she'd be like, no, nah, fam, not tonight, <laughs> you know. At that moment, because I'm angry, that's probably not the best time to bring up, you always deny me. And then those key words, those absolutes, what we call them, those yep, always, yep. never, try to stay away from those words, especially when you are angry. Because even though they never, they, it's not that they always do something or they never do that, but they probably do it. They probably do it often, but it's not always. Because when you throw the absolute in there, it just demoralizes the whole situation. Because it's like, I, I know I don't always do that. But that's probably not the best time to bring up my expectations about sex when she just denied me. Because I'm amped up. She like, you being dramatic, you being extra, and I'm upset. So knowing when to actually bring those times up to talk about those things. What we do is we talk about conflict issues in time of peace. So we can be at the dinner table. Everything's going good. I can say not, not to bring up the past, be like, baby, it makes me feel a certain type of way when this happens. And... If you think about that statement, I never blamed her. I said, it makes me feel a certain type of way when this happens. I didn't say, you make me mad when you tell me no. Just the way you phrase those sayings, it, it does a lot for her. I know it does a lot for her because um, when we were talking about in a minute, talk about blame, sh she doesn't feel that I'm blaming her for how I feel. I'm owning my feelings. We're communicating through it, and that, it, that opens a healthy avenue for us to continue dialogue about whatever it is those absolutes are, re are really important especially when when you're angry it's easy to say you always do this and if we take a second and we pause right there do they always that means that they never don't and the reality is they don't always because that means they're doing it over it's non-stop and that's not the truth or you never you never let me do this do i never or do i sometimes you know what i'm saying and so i think it's important that when we're angry, it's easy to say those things. And then even the I, you statements. Well, you always do this, and you, 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 you. And it may be true, but if you'll take a step back and say, I feel like this makes me happen. When this happens, I feel like this. It just, I'm telling you, it just, it turns it around so that it doesn't feel like you're trying to slap them in the face with what's wrong with them. And even though it is something that they're doing that's wrong, you take yourself to a vulnerable place, which is not always comfortable to be vulnerable, but it's important to be vulnerable because at that point they can say, man, I had no idea that when I did this it made them feel that way. Instead of being like, well, you, 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 you take a step and say, well, I feel like when this happened or I think or I, I feel this kind of thing. And so it's really important to be mindful of that. So... This is, this is one that I'll, I'll take the responsibility for as well. I think it was genetic. I don't know. Anyways, shifting the blame. Man, I, th I even, uh, looking back over some friendships and relationships through college and that kind of thing, I had a girlfriend who told me, she was like, Joy, every time we have a conversation or every time I bring something to your attention, you always shift the blame. And I'm like, you lying. That's why, that's, you know what, that's why I don't fool with you and we done. <laughs> And the truth of the matter is, I lost her as a friend. You know, we're cool now, but we used to be really BFFs. But I didn't see it until probably two or three years later when I got married. And I was like, dang, babe, she was right. I shift the blame. So say we're having a conversation, and he'll say, you know, Joy, I really feel like you did such and such. And what I do is my, my alert sensor's going off, and I feel like, okay, here comes the defense. He's coming for me, so think about something that he's done. Well, what you do is such and such. And the truth is, he might do those things, but in that moment, he's talking to me about me. And it has nothing to do with what he does or what he did or what he finna do. It doesn't matter because I need to deal with what he told me because what he told me is true about me. And that hurts because who wants to really face the mirror sometimes? It's uncomfortable when they tell you something that you do. And even especially when you know you're guilty, be like, dang, he right. Well, you do such and such. And it's like, yeah, but that didn't go anywhere. So I think it's so important for me. I had to 
just to take it in. And it, like I said, it burns. It, it's hard going down. It's a hard pill to swallow when someone is calling you on something that you are not the best at or that it doesn't look good. And so you have to say, you know what? <sighs> You're right. You're right. And in that moment, it's probably not even the best time to talk about what they do. Talk about it later. Save it for later because in that moment, it'll look like, well, thank you. And by the way, you do such and such. Eh, just take it for what it is right there. Yeah, and, and we, we have all kind of code words for this. When, when that happens and we hold up the mirror, we call it, oh, so you being a skunk. Because what happens is, is instead of you doing something to me, I'm going to make you stink first. And so that way, we both are in a crazy or a bad situation, and neither of us are really focusing on the issue. And so when that happens, just imagine what happens when the other, from the other person's point of view. You're being vulnerable. You're trying to tell your spouse, hey, it makes me feel this way when this happens. And then you jump back with, this is what you do. That hurts because that's, I'm coming from a vulnerable spot to tell you what's going on, and then you jump back with, this is what I do. We're not even talking about the situation, how I feel. So what you do is you minimize that other person's feelings and their thoughts without even saying, I don't value your thoughts because that's, wh that's what tends to happen. And, and outside of that, um, that person can shut down. And so you always want to avoid shutting down. I know my shutdown is, okay, all right then, all right, all right. I start doing like that, and because it, it's, it could be something that I don't want to hear. All right, she juggled by me because I go, all right, all right. That's how she know that, okay, TJ's shutting down. Like, give him about four more seconds, and he's going to be all the way out. But it, it, shutting down is almost like the same as defense. Nothing else can go in because you tune yourself out, and then no communication can happen when you shut down. And I can shut down. I, I, I was thinking we had a – it was funny. I don't know if we'll have time, but we had an intense time of fellowship about this, about coming to the conference. It was very interesting, and if we have time, we'll share. But when he started talking, I shut down. I was like, you know what? All right. And I, I didn't even say it in a sarcastic way. I was like, oh, okay. All right. Like that. I wasn't even like, in my mind, I was shutting down. But I was like, if he think I'm shut down, and he going to say you shut down. So if I act like I'm not shut down, but just say, okay, that I agree with it, then we can be done with this conversation. So I was like, all right. All right. Thanks, TJ. And he was like, you shutting down. I was like, no, I'm not. He was like, dang, yes, I am. <laughs> but I didn't want to talk about it anymore. And so I figured if I could just say, okay, and made it seem like I was okay with it then we could just be done with it, and then it'd be done. But that doesn't work. Well, and we'll, we'll finish with that. But the, the story, what happened was when, when Heather and Cornelius asked us to speak at a few sessions, um, I'm, I'm the type of person where I like to just like, okay, well, we want you to speak on these sessions, how it's go. I said, okay, I'm about, to, I'm about to pray. I'm about to get to the heavens. I'm going to float up. Me and Jesus are going to have a conversation. <laughs> so, like, beam me up, Jesus. Crazy, yeah, I come. y'all. He's crazy. And so, and so I started processing and praying about, okay, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? And so I go to her. I'm like, babe, this is what God revealed to me. Oh, you thought you were going to do this by yourself? No way. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold up. No Tell way. Out. He was like, okay, babe, this is what God said, and this is what we're going to do, and specifically this topic, I feel like God is saying this, this, and this. So this is how I'm going to do such and such. And I was like, so I think that it's a marriage retreat, so we got to do it together. He was like, I mean, yeah, but I'm just telling you what I'm going to do. And I'm like, so are you saying that's what you're going to do without me, or am I in there somewhere? And he was like, I mean, why did you assume that it was without you? I said, because you told me what you were going to do. You didn't say, babe, I'm going to do this. What is God saying to you? He never asked that. It wasn't an invitation in, like, well, what is God saying to you, babe? He was like, well, I'm doing this. So, yeah. <laughs> Y'all, we, we literally argued for like an hour. Reagan was asleep, and I was like, babe, this is crazy. He was like, you're assuming. You assumed that when I said I, that you were out of it. I said, no. <laughs> what happened was you were like, this is what I'm doing, and I'm not showing you nothing, and you got to talk to God yourself. And I said, I talk to God, but I need you to say, babe, this is what I'm doing. What is God saying to you? There was no invitation in. It was like, boom, this is what I'm saying, and if you want to sit in the audience or you want to sit beside me, I don't really care because this is what I'm doing. And I'm like, TJ. All that stemmed from... Baby, this is what God told me, and this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> but, but, but seriously, how it happened was there was a severe breakdown in communication. Was, the, the breakdown was so severe where is I didn't adequately explain what I was talking about. She went to assume, and then when you get those things happen, it's like a perfect storm. And, th and that's the, that was the, the whole gist of it. It was just a breakdown in communication. But after we got out of that crazy cycle, and I just, I think crazy I Crazy cycle went on for like an hour. Yeah, and I, I, asked, and I was like, I'm going to go clean the back of my truck. Because like I said, I'm a farmer. I got a whole bunch of stuff in the back of my truck. I'm like, I'm going to clean the <laughs> back of my truck. country boy, y'all. But, and I, I think at the end, I asked her, I was like, what are we arguing about? And that statement right there, she was like, did you gonna do, were you going to do this by yourself? And I was like, I, I really didn't. I was just excited to tell you about what God had told me. And she was like, oh, what, it made, what, what I heard was that you were going to do. And that simple statement was, what are we arguing about? And from that point on, we, I was like, man, you know what we could have been doing with the owl when that baby was asleep? 
and cleaning up the house. <laughs> yeah, cleaning up. <laughs> but but the whole the whole gist of it is learn the keys to stay out of that crazy cycle. So that, those are just some keys that that help us that are they're beneficial for us. And so um, so we just. And then I think that the last thing I would say is is learn to say you're sorry. That is hard sometimes. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. Learn to say you're sorry. And I think too, and the last thing is being vulnerable is uncomfortable. You probably in your life, maybe in parent relationships, sibling relationships, friend relationships, when are you ever really vulnerable and say, exposing yourself to your spouse to say, This is how I feel. And if you're not willing to do that, you probably just won't go very far. But doing that, it brings you closer together. The intimacy level becomes more connected because what happens is you're letting them in. Let them in. I'm not sure who you let in before that may hurt you, but they're not here to do that. So let them in. Let them understand how you feel. Be vulnerable about what they do that may hurt you because in the past you might have been able to tell somebody because they knew they hurt you, they'd probably come for you more, but that's not who they are. So let them in and learn to say, I'm sorry. Babe, I'm sorry. You're right. And I'm sorry and leave it there. Not sorry and explain. Just I'm sorry.